Good evening everyone. My name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the eighth webinar in our 2016 Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. And the fourth webinar is Move Muscle Bone and Joint Health, the new dynamic voice of arthritis and osteoporosis Victoria. This evening's webinar is on the management of tendinopathy. Before introducing our presenter for this evening, however, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the chat box on your screen. You can type a message at any time that will be read by the webinar organiser at Redback Conferencing. We won't be having a visual um, of our presenter tonight, but we, you will be hearing her loud and clearly through the phone. So um, please don't worry about the fact that you won't actually be, be seeing the presenter tonight. Also, whilst our presenter will be willing to answer questions at the completion of her presentation, you can actually type questions for her at any time. Can I suggest that you don't leave your questions to the last minute, as we will aim to finish quite strictly at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. I'd also be grateful if participants could take a moment to complete the exit survey at the end of tonight's webinar. It really should only take you about 10 or 15 seconds to complete that exit survey. Our presenter for tonight is Dr. Ebony Rio. Ebony is a postdoctoral researcher at La Cherub University and has completed her PhD in tendon pain after doing a Master's of Sports Physiology, a Bachelor of Physiotherapy with Honours and a Bachelor of Applied Science. Ebony has won a range of academic and research awards and her clinical career has included work with the Australian Institute of Sport, Australian Ballet Company, Australian Ballet School, Melbourne Heart Football Club and the Victorian Institute of Sport. She has also worked with teams at the Commonwealth Games, the Winter Olympics, the Youth Olympic Olympics and the 2012 London Paralympics. She has also recently spent 18 months travelling with Disney's The Lion King stage show. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Ebony. Thanks very much, Ebony. Oh, thank you so much and thank you everyone for joining us on this Monday night. We're going to talk tendons for the next hour or so and I'd be thrilled for any questions that you've got. Um, to begin with, can I acknowledge uh, Professor Jill Cook Dr. Sean Docking and Associate Professor Craig Purdom because so much of their brilliant, um, their brilliant ideas are in this presentation and also because they've spent, you know, decades really uh, forging the way in how we manage tendons. So I'd really like to acknowledge their contribution to this presentation but also just their amazing ongoing work. Okay, let's get into it. So what I've put together tonight for you guys is, is um, a lot of assumed, based on a lot of assumed knowledge and that's because, you know, people are, are, are seeing patients and, you know, there's a lot of experience but what we want to do is maybe highlight a few things that we see people struggle with. So Professor Jill Cook and I run a tendon clinic together um, and we also teach postgraduate and undergraduate physio and um, so we want to just highlight a few things that we can hopefully help to give you a few clinical tips. So to start with, it's worth having a basic understanding of the pathology of tendinopathy because that really drives some of the interventions that we um, choose to do or might decide that there's no biological basis for. So on the left of your screen, you'll see normal tendon. Now normal tendon's lovely. It's full of amazingly strong type 1 collagen. It's very, very strong. Now there's a few tendon cells and they're the, the long sort of spindle shaped, I'm going to try and be fancy and use a pointer, here we go, the long spindle shaped cells you see here and they communicate with each other along rows and between rows and they're responsible for manufacturing the whole tendon. They're very responsive. So when I went to physio school it was very much, you know, tendons are, you know, connect muscle to bone and they're they're quite inert. But they're they're very they're very active, they're very responsive. Um, to their biochemical environment but also um, particularly to load. So that's our normal tendon and a little bit of a summary for you. You want to think of tendon like a uh, brick wall. So your bricks are the collagen and the mortar is your ground substance or your extracellular matrix. So they sort of support the collagen but 
it's um it, it's you know it's a it's a minor role within the tissue. Now there's minimal vascularity and nerves within tendon. What we have on the right hand side is pathological tendon. So you see the biggest change is to the, the organisation and also the cells. So instead of having our lovely spindle shaped tenocytes here, on the left what we have is our um, rounded cells and they're hysterical, they're activated. And the cell really cares about itself. So what it does is it makes these big proteoglycans that bind water to pack around itself to really try and protect itself. And that draws in a lot of water into the tendon. So if you think about that from an imaging perspective, you can see you know, a, a bowing of a tendon on, on ultrasound. You see an increase in its AP diameter. And that's not um, an inflammatory process. It's cell driven and that's very much bound water. Now we do see an increase in nerves and vessels in abnormal tendon but we'll talk about those in just a moment. So you can see that that's quite a difference in terms of the actual structure of, of our tissue. For those of you that are visual and that includes me, I've got a little schematic here for you. So we've got our spindle shaped tenocytes here. I don't think my point is working very well, but um, I, hopefully you can all see it. Um, what we have is our collagen and not a lot of ground substance and not a lot of water. If we overload this tendon, the first change that we see is our cell change. So an increase in cell numbers, they're rounded and the rounded cells tell you that they're, they're hysterical, they're activated. What these activated cells do, try and protect themselves by increasing the matrix, the extracellular matrix and the bound water. Um, they also churn out you know, a thinner type of collagen. So what can happen with this increase in bound water is you can start to cleave apart that collagen and get these areas of you know, significant disorganisation. End stage pathology is really characterised by this ingrowth of nerves and vessels. So these are uh, opportunistic, they grow into spaces and we have this you know, quite disorganised structure. So that all sounds pretty doom and gloom, but hang in there. What we have um, next on the screen is to just give some framework around that because we don't go from normal tendon to completely degenerative tendon overnight. And that's worth considering with our, um, our patients in front of us. Where do they fit on this continuum of change, you know, from the cell end right through the, to the degenerative tendon? So I want to walk you through this if you're not familiar with it. And this is the... Um, continuum that Jill Cook and Craig Pedham first published in 2009. We've recently um, published an update in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And just to walk you through it, okay, this is normal, oh, look at that, this is normal tendon. If you put some load on that tendon, you get an adaptation and it's stronger. This is where we want to sit. This is where as human beings, we want to slowly load our tissues, get stronger, you know, adapt and, and, you know, use it or lose it, keep them loaded. If you unload your tendon, an example of this might be if you uh, break your ankle and you get put in a cast. So you've unloaded your Achilles tendon and when you're going through your rehabilitation and the physio gives you these, you know, wonderful, slow, progressive exercises, you're optimising your load and everyone's terribly worried about the bone and we, we slowly reload in, as part of the rehab and the Achilles tendon comes along for the ride. So this is an example of everyday life where we go from normal tendon, we unload it, we reload it without even thinking about the tendon but what we have done is provide this lovely graded progression of load and that's what tendons like. Okay, if we have a normal tendon and place excessive load on it, plus individual factors, and we'll talk a little bit about the individual factors, because if I got you all to run the Melbourne Marathon, you wouldn't all get Achilles tendinopathy, but some of you would. So there's, there's some important individual factors. But if we put that aside for a second, put in, um, excessive load on you, we can drive you into this reactive tendinopathy, and that's the, the cell response I was talking about. But if you notice this green arrow here, this is a reversible process. 
completely reversible. If we can modify the load at this point, we can completely revert this tendon to normal. So that's a really important one for us to pick up clinically. If we fail to pick this up and keep overloading this tendon, we can send it into a state of degenerative tendinopathy. And that's the, um, the marker that we we're talking about before with the not only the cell change, but the, the whole change in the, the structure. Once we get to a degenerative stage, we actually can't completely reverse the pathology, but that doesn't mean we can't be pain-free and have full function. So the updated continuum recognises that someone with degenerative tendinopathy, so that's what will um, frequently get reported on our imaging, they can go through phases of flaring up and having a reactive on degenerative um, presentation. So what that means is they have an area of pathology, but it's not the whole tendon. It's a little pocket within the tendon and the remaining part of the tendon that's taking load can go through this process of overload. So you can have a mixed presentation, a reactive on degenerative. And our goal for this person is just to get them back to their normal state of you know, having that area of pathology. So the only other thing to highlight in um, the continuum is, and, and we do see this pretty commonly um, clinically, is the person that doesn't feel like they're really overloaded. So if you have someone who has unloaded their tendon because of another injury, they might have just placed some sort of um, small amount of load, but it's a relative overload or this person might have significant individual factors. They might have a number of systemic conditions that are really contribute, contributing to their presentation. So this is why we can see um, Achilles tendinopathy in people that are actually quite sedentary because their amount of overload, um, their, their threshold is much lower. Okay, and I'm, oh, there we go. I didn't have to worry about the animations. Okay. So that's the continuum of tendinopathy and continuum of, of pathology. But what I want to talk through and put in, in a framework for you is who we see clinically. So what are the clinical presentations out of, out of that? Who, who walks through our front door? So if we start on the left-hand side and we consider the reactive population. Now these are young people and we would consider young, you know, 15 to 25. They have a rapid onset in their symptoms, generally related to load. So this is often the athlete that is, um, you know, talented and they're, they're sent up to the Australian Institute of Sport for their first Basketball Australia camp and they complete, you know, seven basketball sessions in two days. So they have this huge increase in load. The fusiform swelling that I described is because remember how I was saying the cells make those big proteoglycans, it binds water, but what we have is, is this intact um, collagen structure. We have this lovely intact tendon. So it's very, very aggravated and it's, and it's an incredibly um, irritable tendon. Um, but remember, this one we can completely return to normal. So this is one we want to pick up and appropriately modify their load. Now, I work at the Victorian Institute of Sport, and if they, you know, if they stub their toe, by the time they come up the stairs, they've made a doctor's appointment, a physio appointment, booked their own MRI, you know, they're into see sports psych and the dietitian. So it's common in athletes because they present very readily in the real world, um, unless you're working closely with a sports team, people often just back their load off and it settles down. So it's not uncommon that lots of people you talk to have actually had a reactive tendinopathy and you know they leave it alone and a couple of days later they're pretty good. If we go right over to the far hand side, this is the most common thing you'll see is the re reactive on degenerative and there's a flare up of the normal part of the tendon. So the example I like to use is leading into a big event, you'll see a big increase in load, people will have a little bit of underlying you know, pathology in there and they'll overload the normal part of the tendon and become symptomatic. So that's the most common. The one that's in the middle that um, I think is very interesting to point out, and I'm sorry to say that older is over 30 because that definitely puts me in that category as well, 
But these degenerative tendons, we don't think are symptomatic. So a true degenerative tendinopathy only presents when they overload, do something silly and flare up the reactive part of the tendon. That's as best we know what is symptomatic. So I think clinically it's incredibly important for us to recognise whether or not the tendon is the source of symptoms. So you can call this differential diagnosis. That's a huge challenge for us clinically because we don't have a gold standard. People can have pathology and be completely asymptomatic. So it's a huge challenge to confirm whether or not we think the tendon is implicated. So I'm going to go through what we use clinically and what's um, most supported in the research. So the two key clinical questions that we ask for our, our lower limb tendons and our elbows, you're not allowed to ask me any shoulder questions tonight. The two key clinical questions are where is the pain and what aggravates the pain? And that's because these features of tendinopathy that are um, really, really interesting, I think, and very um, uh, common across the tendons. So this is a, a nice little rule of thumb for you. So where is the pain and what aggravates the pain? So let's go through the Achilles tendon because it's really common. So we ask where is the pain? Because regardless of the length of time of symptoms, the pain remains localised. So people can point to it with one finger. Now for the mid substance, we will allow two because people tend to, to pinch. But what they don't do is move their fingers up and down. If anyone's moving their fingers at all, I want your antenna to be up for a different diagnosis. Okay, so where is the pain? People have to be able to point to the pain with one finger. Now the second key feature is that tendon pain is aggravated by activities that ask that tendon to act like a spring. Okay, so while we're getting someone to do these activities, these spring-like activities, their pain remains localised. And I'll talk you through how we do it. So if we take the Achilles example, we would start with a double leg calf raise and we'd ask them for a pain score out of 10 and we'd ask them where their pain is. We would then progress to a single leg calf raise, so we've increased the load on the tendon, so that's our dose-dependent load. We would expect an increase in pain, but the location remains localised, um, the location is localised. That's terrible English, you know what I mean. We would then progress to double leg jump. We would be expecting an increase in pain, but the, the symptoms remain in the same spot, very localised. We could then progress someone to a single leg hop. So I hope you can see that I've increased the load on the tendon from left to right. And what we are asking, what we're looking to see with the tendon is an increase in pain, that the pain remains localised either to the insertion with one finger or the mid substance. So we call this aggravated by dose dependent tendon load. So what I wanted to include for you, and I'm really um, happy for a copy of these handouts, I wanted to include some, some common presentations and a, a few little um, common aggravating factors and, and hallmarks that we see. So plenty of little um, common aggravating factors and, and hallmarks that we see. So plantar fascia, we treat as a tendon. We load through the calf, and I'm happy to answer that question at the end if anyone needs. We know that uh, we see commonly it's in, um, associated with increased BMI. Um, Tib post is quite frequently your mother-in-law, as is mine at the moment. And the interesting thing about Tib post is it can be compressed around the medial malleolus, but also because it moves a lot against the outside sheath of the Tib post, you can also have a, a tenosynovitis, which many of you will see um, on your imaging reports. And I want to give you a little tip for treating those because I've got a great tip from Craig Curtin for you. So Achilles tendinopathy is actually a disease throughout the lifespan. Because when you think about it, you can use your Achilles tendon like a spring if you're a, a you know a young springy athlete, but equally we continue to need to use our Achilles as a spring even walking downstairs or stepping off a curb or changing direction. We're asking the tendon to store energy and release it. And this is why we see Achilles tendinopathy throughout the lifespan. 
Conversely to that is patellar tendinopathy. Patellar tendinopathy is a disease of young jumping men. People that change direction really quickly or jump use their patellar tendon as a spring and pretty much no one else. So not running, for example. So if you had a young female runner or an older female runner or a female athlete at all, I would really like your antenna to be up to see whether or not you think that that's genuinely their, um, their tendon that's giving them problems. And the reason for that is because it affects our management. And I'm going to go through some research in the patella tendon and, and talk through what we did and why we did it and why it wouldn't help another thing like patellofemoral joint, for example. Okay, I'm ha really happy to answer any questions on here. This is for you guys to refer back to and to also maybe promote some um, questions and discussion at the end. Okay, so where does imaging fit? I've said a few times that you can have um, pain, um, you know, regardless of your imaging features. So, and, and conversely, you can have pathology but no, um, no pain. Uh, that's really common. So what do we do then? Well, what I say to my first year students is if you weren't thinking tendon before you sent them for the scan, don't let it change your mind. So imaging should not be used solely for diagnosis. What we're thinking with our imaging, and, and we've seen this in you know, low back pain, is that we can see age appropriate change, we can see load appropriate change, and that just means if you have someone that's used that tendon a lot, it's very likely that they will have some pathology. It doesn't actually help you. In fact, it's a flip of a coin whether or not it's the tendon that's then giving them their symptoms. So the most useful thing is actually a negative finding on imaging. Um, if you have someone with a completely clear ultrasound, um, that probably gives you your best um, possibility of ruling the tendon out, um, but in terms of seeing pathology on, on imaging, it's unused, it's, you know, it's not that helpful. So how do I use imaging? I use imaging to help with differential diagnosis. If I have someone um, with an anterior knee pain that just doesn't fit, so I had a winter athlete who was diagnosed with quadriceps tendinopathy, but he had seven out of 10 walking pain. And that is, that's extreme and it's not an activity that should provoke that much pain in quads tendinopathy because, you know, they're not in deep knee flexion just going for a walk. So I was thinking, you know, plica or something else that is irritating this knee in such small ranges of motion and not a lot of load. So we use imaging for differential diagnosis. Okay. Remember we went through the tendon pathology and it all sounds really doom and gloom. You've got, you know, um, degeneration and vessels and all this stuff going on. I think this piece of research is incredibly cool and I hope you'll agree. So this is courtesy of Dr. Sean Docking. This is his PhD work and I think it's outstanding and really changes our management. So he looked at a whole lot of people with normal Achilles and patella tendons and a whole lot of people with pathology, okay? All you need to know for the purposes of the next two and a half minutes is green and blue means good. So green and blue is good, healthy, load-bearing tendon. Red and black is an area of pathology. Okay, so what he found in people with um, pathological Achilles and patella tendons is their tendons were thicker, which we already knew from the research. He also found they had more disorganisation and pathology. Again, that's no surprise because they're pathological. But this next bit is what's cool. The people that had pathology had more aligned fibular structure. So I'm going to call that normal tendon. They had more tendon that takes load than a completely normal tendon. So Craig Purdom says, think about the donut and not the hole. When you see someone with a big, fat, thickened Achilles tendon, I want you to say, brilliant, well done. Your tendon has adapted. That is sensational because what we have is lots of tissue to work with and it's actually our job to then rehabilitate 
the tendon and the muscle. Now that's a completely different mindset than thinking about addressing the whole or trying to treat the pathology. We don't need to worry about the pathology or the structure in people with tendon pain because they have this adaptation and what we need to do is reduce their pain, gradually reload them back to um, whatever function they want. So I think that's really, really important research. Okay, so let's talk about where the pain comes from for a couple of minutes. This was the um, focus of my um, PhD. I'm most interested in the pain. That's what people come to see us for. Um, it's probably the thing we know the least about. So if we go through a little journey of the research, and the reason why I put this together is to really try and summarise for you a whole lot of research, which is pretty dull to read, but put it in some clinical context. So the first thing regarding tendon pain is that it's unrelated to structure and variable sonographic findings. So someone can have a, such a degenerated tendon that they go on to rupture and have never had symptoms. In fact, that's the most common. That's the group we know the least about because they're not the ones we're seeing. We see people with um, pain and thickened tendons, but the ones that go on and rupture without ever having symptoms, they've had this process go on that went completely unchecked. But what we know in terms of pain is that it's not based on the structure. And the structure doesn't look like it recovers um, as people get better and have no pain. Okay. The second thing, and I think this is really important for us clinically, is that it's not a classic inflammatory process. There's no triphasic sort of scar-based maturative response the way you, you know, um, injure your skin or injure a muscle. So we really discourage the term tendonitis because that implies a, a you know a passive approach, you know, rest ice anti-inflammatories, and I think you'll all agree from having tried it that it doesn't work. So we need to promote an active um, approach to tendinopathy, and that's why we say tendinopathy, not tendonitis, because as best we know, it's it's not an inflammatory process associated with the pain or the pathology. Now in terms of the innovation patterns and the vessels that I talked about, so the new vessels that grow in, they're completely inconsistently linked with pain. So it's end stage pathology, but we know people can have pain in a reactive tendon, but they've got no vessels. We know that the vessels that, that um, the nerves that grow in with the vessels are autonomic. So they're actually responsible for vessel diameter and they're not sensory. Um, and even when the studies have tried to address the neovascularization, there's really mixed um, responses. Now, we wrote a paper a number of years ago um, in 2013 in sports medicine that um, um, gave a, a few suggestions around what might be the nociceptive driver. But the point is the nociceptive driver remains unknown and we really um, don't have a, a local tendon target. But as Sean's research has shown us, perhaps at the moment we really don't need to. We just need to get on with um, improving you know, their function. Okay, so if we just kind of take stop for a second, what are my key clinical tips from um, those few slides? Tendinopathy is a clinical diagnosis. Where's the pain? What aggravates your pain? There's no magic bullet. We don't, um, we have very little understanding what's going on at a tendon level and that's why the research isn't supportive for platelet-rich plasma and all of those, you know, one-off um, injection therapies that, you know, it's really poorly supported. The tendon demonstrates amazing adaptation. Um, the human body's clever. We're a little bit slow to catch on, but the human body is clever. So we think it's really important to address the muscle and sort of remaining kinetic chain so the rest of the other you know, muscles in their legs and arms and really increase their capacity. And the only way of doing this, the only way of changing the mechanical properties of a tendon and changing the function and the mechanical properties of, of muscle is with a load-based intervention. And everyone knew that I was going to say that because I'm really biased. Now, I think it's vital that we understand the different loads because load is what got them into trouble, but it's actually going to be the only thing that salvages them. There's no magic bullet. So there's four types of load. We can have a compressive load, um, 
So you think of a, a, a structure being sort of squashed against a bony prominence like the Achilles down at the um, calcaneus. You have a tensile load, that's when we ask our tendons to act like a spring, so you know, hopping to the Achilles. You can have shear and friction loads. So that's an example of that is the paratendon or the outside sheath of the Achilles sliding and gliding over it when you do a lot of movement. So a clinical example of that, if you have someone come to see you with a, um, you know, Achilles in inverted commas, Achilles pain associated with riding a bike, riding a bike isn't high Achilles tendon load. So that person hasn't done any spring type load for their Achilles, they've done tons of friction load. If their heel has dropped off the back of the pedal, that paratendon has moved over the tendon, you know, lots and lots and lots, they've irritated the paratendon and what they have is a shear or friction um, presentation and the reason why that's important is we manage it differently and I'll get to that in a second. The last one is combination. Now, if I'm a cell in the body and I'm undergoing lots of tensile load, if someone's asking me to be really springy and I'm undergoing lots of compressive load, I'm getting banged up against a you know, bony prominence, the only thing I know how to make to withstand those loads is bone. So when you see calcific tendinopathy and you know, the bony fragments and stuff in imaging, get on with it. It doesn't have to change your management. You can, um, that is just a tendon that is telling you it's been loaded and it's undergone lots of different um, combination loads. So you can reassure your patients when they see it to not freak out. We don't need to take that out. We can actually just get on with it. Okay, so this is a little summary for you of what I just said. So what's happening at a structural level depends on the sort of load. Um, so that's you know the best way to think about your, your tendons are a spring, but they do undergo a number of different other loads. Combined loads is a big challenge for us because most of our problem tendons actually have combined loads. So you think of something like the, um, the you know the Achilles tendon is the most obvious example when someone's you know going into to dorsiflexion or or dropping. Um, you know, doing a stretch or getting some sort of aggravation, they have the combination load of both the tensile load and the compression. But the good news is then, is that we can identify what the abusive load is, try and remove the abusive load, but not give them complete rest. Because whenever you give someone complete rest, all you do is drop their capacity. So I want you to think of your load and your capacity as really closely related. So the capacity of your tissue will only ever just exceed the load you put on it, okay? So it's the use it or lose it. So if I drop my load because um, I, I think I should, I've had Achilles pain, so I'll take you know, three weeks off, all that happens to my capacity in my tendon and my calf muscle and all the other muscles is it drops. Then when I go to run again, I can really quickly exceed my capacity. I hope that makes sense to everyone. That's how I think about it. That's how we explain to patients. So what we want to do is remove the abusive load, but not all load. You want to keep the load on there that's not aggravating them. So if you can identify compression, that's, a, that's brilliant because you can make a massive difference to someone's pain, but not completely immobilize them. A good example of this is a really big heel raise. So we actually go outside the shoe. So girls, it's really easy. We can get them in some high heels. Boys, we can get them in some cowboy boots or even some of the work shoes or wedge something into their shoe. But you can get the Achilles insertion right out of compression, but not put them in a cam walker or something, for example, and immobilize them. The other little um, key point I want to make here is there's no such thing as an isolated bursitis. The tendon and the bursa are so intimately related that if you have a diagnosis of you know, gluteus medius bursitis, you have glute med tendinopathy. And our interventions that only address the bursa in the short term, like the cortisone, unless we address the compression and the issue around the tendon, these problems come back. And I know that um, many people would have stories of that. Okay, so this is how we think. 
we get people's current capacity. So this is what we do in our assessment. We will assess their strength. We'll talk about how um, irritable the tendon is. We'll find out if the tendon's coping with the current load. We'll find out what all of the irritating loads are. And then we'll find out what they want to do. So do they want to run a marathon in under three hours? Do they just want to walk around nine holes of golf without pain? What do they want to be able to do? Then what we do is we go through and give them a progressive um, rehabilitation that gives them very small steps because tendons hate change. They hate change. So what we need to do is just slowly progress them but be quite specific. So identify any strength problems they've got and um, address those and then teach the tendon to be a little bit springy again up to whatever um, level they need it to be from your elite you know high jumper right through to someone that just wants to you know be able to walk around the park with their kids now one thing that we don't have time to cover tonight are the potential systemic drivers. I'm really happy to answer any questions, but what I did want to do for you is just give you a, a little taster and you guys will be more across this um, you know, than, than physios are, but this is the sort of thing I look for. I'm really interested in if there's any um, evidence or family history of a, a rheumatological presentation, you know, gout, pseudo gout. Um, breast cancer, um, because of the, the early menopause, we think that estrogen is quite protective for tendons. So menopause is a really vulnerable time um, for women. Um, we ask about fluoroquinolone, so it's a specific <coughs> pardon me, antibiotic that's associated with tendon pain, um, tendon rupture and tendon pathology. We ask about diabetes, we ask about high cholesterol. If we are suspicious of any of these conditions, we'll involve a doc because obviously unless they're getting um, you know, managed for these you know, systemic conditions, we're only going to get so far. But what we ask our, um, our medical colleagues to do is um, work with us so that we can slowly load this person and, and get them back um, to what they want to be able to do. So it's a really complementary approach. Everyone is going to need um, different amounts of, of each of our specialties and um, you know we get really good results working together. Okay, so what are our goals in rehabilitation? We find out what our patient goals are, what do we have to you know rehabilitate this tendon to be able to do. We are focused on this donut. The body is really clever. Don't spend all your time on the, the adjuncts um, and anything directed at you know the whole. Okay, so what are the deficits? This physical examination is something we would typically take someone through. So after we've um, assessed you know, where's the pain, what aggravates the pain, gone through a very thorough subjective, what we then want to do is um, find out about what their deficits are. The key thing I want to alert you to this is that poking and palpation is actually not that helpful for the tendon or for confirming the tendon. You, uh, so Jill Cook published in 2001 that um, asymptomatic um, athletes had sore tendons when they were poked. So it can be misleading. You can get a false positive. We will put our hands on patients for differential diagnosis, you know, checking joint effusion, all of those sort of things. But if you have someone with vague pain but it hurts to poke their tendon, I would still rule the tendon out if their pain is um, vague. We're interested in that localised pain with load. Localised pain with load. Okay, I want to share with you a little bit of um, research so that you guys can um, you know, have sort of the, the cutting edge stuff that we're interested in. So we know in tendinopathy that people have pain and you know they have a reduction in their strength and tissue capacity because they unload and all of those sorts of things and they get into this horrible cycle and, and that's not new information. But what I was interested in is what else is going on. So we've termed this motor drive and you want to think about the motor cortex and the corticospinal pathway. So the projections to um, the motor neuron pool, okay, what's driving the muscle that's attached to the tendon. In doing this research, I use transcranial magnetic stimulation. I won't bore you with the details, but what I'll tell you, if you want to think about 
the excitability and the inhibition, like the brake and the accelerator of a car. So every muscle action you do is a balance between your excitability and inhibition or your brake and your accelerator. Um, up the top here, we have our accelerator. This is our excitability. For our control participants, as we increase the intensity on the stimulator, so this is me um, zapping their brain with a magnetic um, impulse, as we increase the intensity of that impulse, what we record from their muscle is this lovely graded sigmoid response. That's what it's called. That's true of men, women, any muscle in the body. What we saw in our patella tendon group, so these were young jumping men with localised pain at the inferior pole of the patella. So nothing, 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 bang, they switched everything on and then they plateaued. They had a very different profile to our control group. In a different study, we looked at their inhibition. So this is their break. And this is the inhibition range for people without uh, telotendinopathy. And a normal range of inhibition is, you know, 50 to 70 percent. What this indicates is that people with patellar tendon pain had huge amounts of inhibition. Their brain was saying, don't use your quadriceps, don't use your quadriceps. It was really trying to limit the, the activity of the quadriceps. So what we have is huge amounts of inhibition, huge amounts of excitability. So the brake and the accelerator are stuck on. They have this incredibly different neuroscience profile. But what I want to highlight to you is that this response here was unique to pain at the inferior pole. So we had another group of people with vague anterior knee pain, so you can call it fat pad, patellofemoral joint pain, call it whatever you like, and they had a normal profile. They had this one. And all of these data were analysed blind to group, but I could zap their brain by the end of the study and tell you whether or not you had patellar tendon pain or something else. So the brain cares about differential diagnosis. Okay, so all of a sudden, there's a bit more going on. We've got our strength and our changes in tissue capacity. We know we've got pain, and now we have to think about the brain and the, you know, what's going on there. So how are we going to address, address that? Well, this is my summary slide on some of the, the adjuncts that are offered for people with tendinopathy. So platelet-rich plasma, um, just to have another crack at that, but cell-based therapies, you know, some of them are incredibly expensive. And this is how I think about it. Where are they targeted? Probably at structure. But we've talked about whether or not we actually need to target structure. Some of them are directed at pain. So what's our take on adjuncts? Well, anything that allows them to do their loading that isn't detrimental for the tendon is okay. You know, can they have massage? Can they ice? They can do any of those things. They'll never add up to enough on their own without a load-based intervention. Anything that addresses their symptoms that allows them to load is okay. The issue is that many of them have risk. And many of them actually require downtime. So after they have some sort of invasive intervention, they're asked to have you know, downtime, they reduce their tendon and muscle capacity, they go to load again, and you know whatever it was hasn't worked. So when you think of how complex tendon presentations are in terms of these things, I think it's easy to see why our unimodal interventions really let us down. You know, it's a really complex condition. And um, I hope you'll agree with Sean's research that it's probably good evidence that in a lot of people, we don't have to address the pathology. So if we only change pain without addressing the underlying strength and function or motor drive, it's likely to result in pain recurrence. So what do we do? We do a progressive um, loading program where first of all, we're addressing um, the pain. Jill and Craig first used this with a really um, sound reverse engineering. So you think, you know, complete rest is detrimental for tendons, but springy tensile load is really aggravating. So if we can't completely rest, maybe we can put a, a static load on it. So I want to quickly explain this research to you. So if we think of isometric load as being a static load, um, this is one of the studies I did for my PhD. This is people with patellar tendon pain, so pain at the inferior pole. Now, they were randomised to either an isometric 
So a static load or isotonic, so that just means through range, both the concentric and eccentric. Some of you might be thinking, why didn't we do eccentric, concentric and eccentric? Some of you might be thinking, why didn't we do eccentrics? Um, and I'm really happy to answer any questions at the end on eccentrics. Their results are actually incredibly um, disappointing for many of our tendinopathies. Um, so please feel free to fire a question at me about um, eccentrics. I'd be happy to answer it. But what I want to show you is these poor athletes had um, tons of pain before the um, the intervention. So seven and a half out of ten on a pain provocation test. These are in-season athletes. Now, an immediate um, reduction in um, pain after the static isometric loading. So what we saw was, you know, huge reduction in pain and um, sustained for at least 45 minutes. We saw a reduction in excess motor inhibitions, so that lifted the brake. And what that means is they had an increase in their strength. So following a very heavy static muscle hold and a static hold for the tendon, they were actually stronger. So we use this in um, athletes, we use it in the workplace, um, we, we use this a lot to reduce pain. Um, so this is how we use it. We use it um, you know, really commonly now with our painful tendons. So just to finish off, what I want to do is um, really put that in, in context for you. So we've used load to reduce pain um, using isometric holes and we see that we can use, we know we can use loading interventions to improve our strength, but how can we actually hit the bullseye and target the motor drive? Now these data are courtesy of Mike Luong, this is his PhD. If I get you to do a visual motor skill, so if I get you to copy a screen and, and move your limb at the same time as something on the screen, you get a ton of plasticity, okay? You get a huge increase in your excitability and changes to your inhibition. If I get you to do self-paced strength, and self-paced strength is what we currently ask our patients to do. We send them off to the gym and we say, oh, you know, do four lots of six and they'll start the first one and then they'll think about what they're having for dinner and then they'll forget what they're up to. This is self-paced strength you actually don't get changes to your plasticity. You don't uh, induce plasticity. However, if you do a metronome-based strength, so that's where you get a metronome um, sound and you get someone to pace their strength training to this external audible cue, you get the same changes to plasticity as doing the skill. So we can actually tap into this. So just to summarise for you, and put it all together, if we do a completely passive intervention, like an injection into the tendon, we have not changed their strength, we have not changed their muscle drive, we cannot be surprised it's not a magic bullet. We cannot be surprised that our unimodal interventions are really disappointing. What about if we do a load-based intervention? Well, if we have not understood neuroplasticity and, and paced it in some way, perhaps our undesired outcome is actually recurrence or recalcitrance. These tendons are really difficult to treat. What about if we ignore the strengths and think, oh, well, it's just all about the brain? Well, they still need the capacity in their tissues to do what they, they want to do. So what we advocate is that we actually address all of these different things by using something like externally paced load. So that's using a metronome while they exercise um, to really capitalise on that, um, that middle bit. So this is my summary slide, Jen, with one minute to go. I've just snuck in. So we're really keen to change tendon pain in rehabilitation or in season or in the workplace, whoever the person is in front of us. And the best way to do that is load modification, so working out their abusive load, adjuncts that don't irritate the tendon, and then using progressive load on top of that to rehabilitate them back to what they want to be able to do. If I can give you one little tip, remember I said the person with the Achilles paratendonitis from um, dropping their heel off the step, that's a friction load. You want to address the paratendon. A great way to do that is half heroid cream, half Voltaren cream. They slather it together, glad wrap it on overnight, not 
so it's super tight but just so um, it seeps in. They need about seven nights where if they can do night on night off if it interrupts their sleep or upsets their skin and what that does is it actually blocks the process that induces the crepitus and the inflammation in the sheath. So what I would give that person is I wouldn't let them do calf raises and load that moves the sheath. My loading modification for them would be taking away those loads versus someone that had a problem within their tendon, you would actually get them started on their strength work. Um, we get people to listen to their tendon. What we want to see is an increase in load with obviously a decrease in pain. If they're increasing the load and the pain stays the same, that's still a win. Okay, this is what I was describing before. Unless we address the key thing, all the other things on the outside will never add up to enough. So don't focus on um, just the passive therapies, make sure they're doing load. This is the very last slide. Sorry, Jen, I promised before it was the last slide. Um, I, again, I wanted to include a summary slide for you for what if it's not working. This is what we would do. We get back to basics. We recheck our diagnosis. We make sure we're um, incredibly fussy. We make sure we've removed all the compression and understanding the high tendon load within their week. And we now most certainly use load, so we use isometric load to reduce pain and also their motor inhibition. So I'd like to thank you so much for joining me. I know there was a ton in there, but I get a little bit excited about tendons, as you probably guessed. Um, and yes, thank you all so much. Ebony, that was that was an incredibly generous presentation. You certainly have, you know, uh, provided so much comprehensive information there. That's just been marvellous. Um, I hope people are taking the opportunity. You did invite people throughout the presentation with a few different things that you mentioned to to come back and, and to sort of pose a question for you at the end. So if anyone hasn't um, asked a question at this stage but would like to, could you please type your question into the message box now? We have one question that's come up so far in relation to a, a particular case presentation. Uh, a 50 year old woman with a 12 month history of sore right Achilles in the tendon area very tender to touch, can't take any NSAIDs, ice is no help, Voltaren gel is tender to apply. Using T two FACs, difficult to move right ankle. Do you have any thoughts? She's also got quite high anxiety. Yeah, that's that's a really great question and probably not uncommon either in terms of what we would see. So there's a, there's a few things there. Um, don't don't worry about the tenderness to touch. That will be the last thing to get better. So what you want to do is really reassure your patient to um, to not poke it because it's it's unhelpful. It'll keep it tender. Think of it like a bruise. If you keep poking it, it actually keeps it a little bit tender. The other thing is that'll be the last thing to go. That'll be um, sore still after they're, they're back doing things. I'm not surprised that ice and um, is is no help. That's actually not uncommon that our patients tell us that. Um, I would be really keen, and it doesn't say if she's insertion or mid substance, but if she was insertion, um, you'd be really keen to get her in some nice high shoes and get her right out of compression. She'd be someone that would be worth trying the isometrics for. If she's very deconditioned, you could actually use a seated calf raise machine and go below body weight. If you could, you could get her standing and try, um, you know, on, on two feet rising up onto her toes, making sure she's holding on really well. Um, yeah, and just making sure there's no other sort of systemic contributors. I, I hope that helps, Margaret. Yes, Should I just go on to the next question? Yes, so the next question is about the tip post tendinopathy. How do you treat it? Yeah, sure. So you might remember, can I flick back to the slides at the same time to show a picture? Yep, it works. Okay, super. So can everyone see the screen? Yep, perfect, this is nodding. Okay, so I want to alert you. So Sue Mays, who's the physio at Australian Ballet, is amazing. So the middle of the second toe joint and the middle of the ankle joint, you want to line that up perfectly. The problem with tib post is they've, they often drop into that sort of pronated, they lose that, um, that support through their medial arch. So they get a lot of compression of the tib post. So the first thing is, this is a tendinopathy where some good orthotics can be helpful. That's the first thing. 
The second thing is they often do better in a little high heel because if you think about it, if you're um, in if your feet are flat and you're really compressing through that medial arch, if you just lift the heel a little bit, you can reduce the compression on the tendon. So they often hate being in, um, you know, flat shoes and the sensible shoes they're given. They're often better in their little boots and their little high heels. The third thing is, this is a, um, a mixed presentation. So they also usually have the tenosynovitis. So they do beautifully with the half voltar and half heroid as well as we use some isometrics. And the isometrics, you have to line up the middle of the ankle joint and the middle of the second toe joint. That way you're going to get an isometric load through your tip post, but out of compression. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, thanks, Ebony. We'll, we'll keep moving on. The next question about the um, tenosynovitis. Yep, so the FHL tenosynovitis, it's the same um, concept of addressing the tenosynovitis. So you want to put the half voltar and half heroid around through uh, this region, through that tunnel where they have pain. You also want to avoid lots of movements. They're often dancers where they're going through big ranges of motion. So you might need to unload them from that um, for a little, a little while. And there's one more question there from Brenda um, about Ali's tenon, you said, half Volterran cream and half something else. Yeah, so this is specifically for the paratendon. So if we're thinking the sheath, so the outside sheath of the tendon, it's half Volterran um, or Nurofen cream, the anti-inflammatory cream, and it's half Heroid. So that's a heparin based cream. Um, so it's either sold as a bruise cream, a hemorrhoid cream, like a lazenol or something like that. So it's called something different depending on where you are. In Australia it's called Heroid and it's the half half. And critically, it's the mix that's really important. We've tried um, either of those things in isolation and it's just not nearly as effective. Now remember these things are really sensitive, so don't really rub it in, you're just slathering it on. Ebony, I think that might be it for questions. I think uh, you just uh, had so much information in your presentation. I'm surprised that pre you probably answered everyone's questions and provided so much information as we went Well, completely along. overwhelmed everyone, I hope. <laughs> Well, there's no doubt that your passion for tenons has been very evident this evening. So listen, uh, thank you so much, Ebony, for a great presentation. And uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us this evening. Can I ask that you take a moment when we uh, come off air to uh, complete the exit survey? And I'll also just remind you about our next webinar on Thursday, the 18th of October, with Professor David Hunter. We'll be talking about osteoarthritis translating research into practice. So on that note, thanks everyone for joining us this evening and thanks once again, Ebony, it was a great presentation. Good night, everyone.